So now I want to look at DAGs, and DAGs are just kind of a, a specific type of graph that have some properties that we've already seen. So the D stands for uh, directed. So it's a directed graph. Most of the examples we've looked at so far were undirected. Uh, the A stands for acyclic, uh, and G stands for graphs. So again, this is kind of a, a graph with some very specific properties. And we're going to build towards something called topological orderings or topological sorts. But we'll, we'll get to these two topics, DAGs and topological sorts, by building off of something that we've just been looking at. So we'll look at uh, depth-first search. So we're going to augment our depth-first search to keep track of some time. So when a vertex happens to be started and when it's finished. So We'll be applying this approach to directed graphs for now uh, to kind of start on our way towards directed acyclic graphs and this idea of topological sort and what it really means and what it's good for. So again, we'll start off with DFS. So we'll augment our DFS algorithm to do some additional accounting. So we'll mark vertices with times. They'll basically have a, a time that represents the start time and their finish time. And rather than times, you can actually just think of these as counts. Every time we process a node, we'll add one to the count. And so the count kind of indicates um, uh, when a node starts being processed and when it's finished processing. And we'll, we'll increment the time either when we start a new node or finish an old node. OK, so let's look at pseudocode for uh, doing depth first search with this idea of keeping track of start and finish times. So the pseudocode is, is going to be a recursive approach to DFS. So we'll start at a particular vertex v. Um, since we're processing it, we'll go ahead and uh, mark the time that we start processing it. So each vertex will keep track of its start time and also its finish time. Uh, then we'll advance the time by one. We will process all of the edges leaving that vertex. Uh, so we'll look at what the edge connects to. So if it connects to another vertex U and it has not yet started being processed, that means it's something we haven't seen yet. Um, then we will recursively call our DFS visit. So this recursive call was kind of equivalent to pushing something onto the stack in our last version. So we'll temporarily pause processing vertex V and we'll go off and process vertex U recursively until we're completely done with U. And then we'll return and process V. And once we get back to V, we're going to mark that we're actually done with it. So we'll set V's finish time to whatever the current time is. And uh, then we'll advance the time by one. Okay, so kind of the big picture here is when we start processing a node, we mark the start time. When we're completely done processing the node, we mark the finish time. And any time we uh, store away a time, whether it be the start time or the stop time, uh, we will afterwards increment the time. So all the time should be distinct. Once we store a time, the time then gets incremented, so the next time that's stored is at least one greater. Okay, so we'll work through a, a graph very similar to the ones we've been using so far, but note this time the graph happens to be directed. Uh, just like before, I'm going to go ahead and start at node A. Um, I've also simplified the graph, so everything here is actually connected. Um, one other thing I want to mention, I'm going to use notation on each of the nodes. So in the upper left, I'm going to indicate the start time, and in the bottom right, I'm going to indicate the stop time. Okay. So I am also going to go ahead and keep track of my time uh, down here. So I'm just going to write numbers as I go. So we'll arbitrarily start at time 1. We could start at time 0 if we wanted to. It doesn't really matter. Um, so remember the basic algorithm. When I start visiting a node, I'll note the start time. I'll increment the time by 1. Uh, and then I'm going to process each of the edges. And I'll check to see if it's been started yet. And if not, I'll go ahead and uh, visit it as well. Um, so in our previous version of DFS, we actually kept track of the explicit stack. Here, I'm going to keep track of the stack as well, but this time it's the, the runtime stack. So uh, when we're recursively calling our procedure, this will automatically be handled for us by the programming language, but it'll help me keep track of, of what work happens next. So um, I'm going to go ahead and run DFS starting at uh, node A. Okay. Um, so we'll visit A, we'll mark our start time. Um, for each edge, oh, sorry, we mark our start time and we increase our time. Um, for, for each edge going out from A, 
uh, we'll look to see whether the um, uh, opponents, the, uh, the opposite ends start time has been set. So I'm just going to work clockwise at each node. So I'm at node A right now. I'm going to work clockwise from A. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, pause right here. As I go through each arc, just to keep track of my work, I'm going to go ahead and check it off. So A will uh, process uh, arcs clockwise starting from, um, I'm going to start at midnight. There's nothing up here, so come around to uh, 3 o'clock here. Um, so we will do a DFS visit starting at D. So we will traverse that link. Uh, when we get back to A, we need to continue going clockwise around. Okay, um, so now we start recursively processing at D. Um, so we go ahead and mark D's start time. So it looks like the time is currently 2, so D starts processing at time 2. I'm going to cross that off, and we're now up to time 3. Um, we do the same thing at D. We're going to uh, process all of the outgoing edges, looking for a place where the uh, start time is not yet set. So again, I'm going to go clockwise starting at midnight. The, the first time I get to an edge uh, it will be the edge to F, so it's the outgoing edge to F. Um, I am going to now recursively call DFS starting at F. Uh, so D, we're still in the middle of processing, but we will uh, dealt with this outgoing edge. When we get to F, we'll go ahead and mark our start time starting at time 3. We'll uh, increase the time to 4. And same thing all over again. I'm going to start at midnight, go clockwise until I find a, an arc. Uh, so I found this arc to G. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and recursively call DFS on G. And now I'm going to go ahead and uh, recursively start my algorithm. So we start processing G at time 4. We add 1 to our time and we get up to 5. Um, okay. Uh, same, uh, by the way, I'm going to mark off that F has already processed this one link. Um, so same thing all over again. We start uh, processing outgoing edges from G. G actually has no outgoing edges, so there's nothing to do. It gets uh, completely processed. Uh, and before it's actually uh, completely removed from the stack here, we'll mark our start time. So our, I'm sorry, our stop time. So our stop time is 5, and we'll increment our time. And then uh, G is removed from our stack. Now we pick up processing at F. So F, we had, we'd gotten halfway around and we'd process this one outgoing link to G. We continue around. There are no more outgoing links. Just like we did with F, we'll uh, note our stop time is 6 and uh, change our time to 7 and remove uh, F from our stack. And now we've kind of backtracked to G. So G, if you remember, we were part way around. We were uh, we had processed as far as F. Now we'll continue around the circle until we get to C here. Um, so we'll recursively call DFS at C. And again, I'm going to check this off to indicate that's where we're pausing on D. Um, so we'll enter C. Uh, the first thing we'll do is we'll note our start time and increment our overall time. Um, and then we'll, we'll Go through this process. We'll look for all outgoing edges from C. There are no outgoing edges from C. So we'll go ahead and note our stop time, increment our time, and then uh, recursive processing of C is completely done. So we pick up again at D. And at this point D, we've processed all of the outgoing edges. We'll note the stop time is 9, and increase the time to 10, and remove D from our stack. Okay. At this point, we're back to node A. If you remember, we were part way around, uh, so we'll continue around the loop. So, um, uh, so we'll look at our next link to C, and C is the first case where the if statement inside of our uh, method comes into play. So we notice that it already has a start time set. Um, so that means it's either in the process of being handled, or it's completely handled. In this case, it has both a start time and a stop time, so we're completely done with C. Uh, if it, as long as it has a start time, we don't need to look at it again. It's already being looked at. Um, so we continue along, uh, and now we'll recursively process starting at uh, B. Again, I'm going to check that off. Uh, so we'll pick up at B. We'll start processing it at 10 units of time. We'll advance our time. Uh, B, we will again go clockwise around looking for outgoing links. 
uh, we'll start a uh, recursive DFS on E. And again, I'm going to keep track of the fact that I've already used that outgoing link. Um, and uh, so we'll uh, start processing E at time 11. We'll advance time to 12. Um, we'll go clockwise around E looking for outgoing links. There's this outgoing link to C. Um, but again, C has already has a start time, so this is we're, we're going to ignore it. We're going to consider it to already be in the process of being handled. We'll continue around. We'll find there's nothing left to do. Um, so we'll go ahead and save our stop time and increase our time. And then we'll remove E from our stack. And then we'll get back to B. And we'll, uh, we're completely done with all the outgoing links from B. So we'll update our time at B, uh, note our stop time, and update our overall time. Uh, and B is completely done. And then we'll return to A. And uh, we'll note the stop time at A. And at this point, we're completely done recursively traversing through. OK, so if we were to analyze this for time complexity, one of the things we'll notice is that we only process something if it doesn't already have a start time set. And as soon as we start processing node, we set the start time. So at most, each vertex is only going to be uh, called with this recursive function once. So um, and, and at each vertex, we'll look at all of its edges. So the total amount of work here, uh, almost everything else in here is constant time. So we've got all these constant time things. Um, and the total number of, of calls to this will basically be based on the number of vertices we have, assuming that every vertex is reachable. In the worst case, if we can get to every vertex, it'll get to every vertex exactly once. And for each vertex, it's going to look at the outgoing edges. And um, so this will basically be the total number of edges in our graph. So these are directed edges, so we'll only look at each edge once, starting at the start location. So um, our total time complexity is the number of vertices plus the number of edges. OK, so just to highlight that, visiting each vertex uh, is theta of the number of vertices. Visiting each edge is theta of the number of edges. And so the total amount of work we have to do is the sum of those two. Now, this is assuming that it's really, really easy to visit each edge from a, a particular vertex. So this is assuming that we have the adjacency list implementation that we've looked at. Um, so it's worth taking some time and thinking about how this would perform with either uh, the concept of an edge list or with an adjacency matrix. OK, so why are we interested in adding these uh, start and finish times? Um, one of the things is it gives us a little bit more information and we can detect things that we couldn't detect without them. Um, so first off, um, let's, let's just start with a basic understanding. DFS will find all nodes that are reachable from a particular node. So if we start DFS at node W, it will find everything that we can possibly get to from W. So it explores all the outgoing edges from W and it, it for each of those vertices, it explores all the outgoing edges from those and so on and so forth. Um, okay, so um, if it, another interesting side effect of this is if it finds a node that's been started but not yet finished, that means that there was a loop back to the node. Remember, part of this, this component is we're look, going to look at directed acyclic graphs. So we might be able to use DFS to determine if there happens to be a cycle in our graph. So DFS can find cycles, so let's prove that. So the claim here is that if a graph contains a cycle, uh, a graph G contains a cycle if and only if DFS finds a vertex that is started and not yet finished. Okay, so if and only if means that we're going to have to, um, in order to prove this, we've got two things to prove. We've got to prove that if DFS finds something that's started and not finished, that uh, that means the graph has a cycle. And then we have to prove that for all graphs that have a cycle, uh, DFS will find something that started not finished. So let's start with that first part. So if DFS finds a vertex that started and not finished, that means there must be a cycle in G. So imagine that we're processing DFS at U. And we find an ver adjacent vertex W that fits our pattern here. It started but not yet finished. What does that mean about W? That means that DFS with W was called earlier, and it's not yet done. 
So we started processing DFS of W. Remember that when we call DFS on a particular node, that means that we find everything that it, it can get to. There's a path from W to the node we're currently on, U. So hence, uh, there is a path from W to U. Okay, and we're on U, and uh, clearly there's an edge that goes from U back to W. So since there's an edge from U back to W, there must be a cycle. So again, uh, since W is opened and not yet closed, we know that there's a path to U. And since we're currently on U and we can see W, we can get back to W and see that it started but not yet finished, that means that there's a, a complete loop. Okay, let's look at the other part of the implication here. Um, the fact that if um, uh, G contains a cycle, DFS will definitely find it. Okay, so if GS, GFS contains a cycle, if and only if, uh, DFS finds a vertex that started and not finished. So if there's a cycle in G, DFS will find a vertex that started and not finished. So um, this is what we're trying to prove. So let's assume that G does contain a cycle. Let W be the first vertex of the cycle found by DFS. And suppose, it's, uh, suppose the cycle includes edges U and W. Um, okay, so there's a, a node W that we get to, and we know that there uh, is some edge back to W from U. We know that DFS W will not return, it won't close W until it's gotten to everything that we can reach from W. Uh, so that includes U. So at some point, um, we will get to U, this, this other node in the cycle, and uh, DFS at U will find this unfinished um, vertex W. So we'll loop back around. So as a proof of concept, let's uh, refer back to our familiar problem. I've modified it slightly this time to show that there is in fact a, a loop here. Um, so just like before, I'm going to keep track of the uh, runtime stack. And we'll, we'll start at uh, node A here. Um, okay, so we'll call DFS at node A. Again, I'm going to start uh, going around clockwise at uh, starting at midnight at A until I find a, a link that hasn't yet been explored. Um, so um, we'll go ahead and keep track of our time as well. So starting at 1. So we start processing A at time 1. Um, and then we increment the time to 2. Um, we'll look at our outgoing nodes. We will start recursively processing DFS at D. Uh, so we'll start processing it at time 2, increment our time to 3. Um, start recursively processing uh, its outgoing nodes, starting at uh, 12 o'clock position, going clockwise. We'll get to this outgoing uh, link to F. Um, so we'll start processing F at time 3, increment our time to time 4, uh, recursively, uh, I'm sorry, uh, go through all the outgoing links from F and get to G. Um, start DFS at G, uh, so it'll start at time 5. Uh, there's no outgoing links from G, so we will go ahead and, um, sorry, it started at time 4, then we incremented the time to 5. We process the outgoing links from G, uh, which there are none of, so we close it off at time 5, update our time to time 6. We get back to F, there are no more outgoing links, so uh, we close it off. Its stop time is 6, increase the time to 7. We get back to D, uh, we move on to the next available outgoing link. So we're now uh, going to recursively call DFS at C. Um, so we mark off that outgoing link. Uh, we're going to go ahead and start processing at C at time 7. Um, increment our clock to time 8. Uh, then from C we're going to look at all of its outgoing nodes, uh, outgoing links, and we'll see this link back to A. And notice A is the first case where we get back to something that has a start time but not a stop time. Um, so this is our indicator that we have in fact found a, uh, a loop. So the loop from A to D to C is, is pretty easy to see. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and stop there, but we could continue with the algorithm. It would still complete the uh, full exploration of this graph. But if we're just interested in detecting simply whether this is a 
uh, acyclic graph or not, at this point we found our calendar example. It is not acyclic. It has a cycle in it, and we can stop. Okay, finally we can get to the uh, idea of a topological order, which is actually kind of a, an interesting and useful thing. In fact, it's something that you've probably encountered and thought about already. Maybe you just haven't thought about it formally and haven't known that you were working with uh, the concept of a topological order. Um, okay, so topological order is uh, something that's defined on directed acyclic graphs. So this only makes sense if it's a directed graph. Uh, we'll come back to why in just a second. And also only makes sense if it's an acyclic graph. Um, so uh, a topological order is any total ordering of the vertices consistent with the partial order defined by the edges. So you might be thinking, huh, what does that mean? Um, so I want to look at an example that you've probably recently uh, experienced something comparable to. So I want to talk about the idea of a topological order based on something that you are probably going to do pretty regularly, uh, registering for courses. So when I was a student, there were certain topics I was interested in, and I remember as a freshman, I wasn't ever sure how I would uh, eventually uh, learn enough to be able to do the really complicated things that sounded super interesting to me. Um, so I'm going to take an example here from the Computer Science and Engineering Bulletin's list of courses. Uh, imagine you're interested in something like machine learning. It's a really, really popular topic right now. So you may want to come up with a game plan for how you could eventually take machine learning courses. So I'm searching for any course that mentions machine learning. Uh, so there's this data science course. I'm guessing machine learning is kind of a side topic in there, but it's, it's probably a great course. Oh, intro to machine learning, uh, intro to intelligent agents using science fiction. That sounds like a lot of fun, but again, machine learning might be kind of a side topic. Um, introduction to machine learning. Well, that's that's right on. Uh, but this is kind of an intro course. I want to I want to really learn a lot about machine learning. So I eventually want to get beyond this. So let's let's keep going here. Intro to computer security. Again, machine learning is probably kind of a, a peripheral topic there. Theory of artificial intelligence and machine learning. Wow, that sounds pretty high up there. It's a 513. Um, let's go ahead and see if there's anything else here. Bayesian methods in machine learning. Oh gosh, so that's that's going to be pretty heavy on the math and statistics. Um, Wow, I wonder what it would take to, to be able to take this class. So now I want to start working backwards. And this is probably something that you may have done or will do with your academic advisors. So if I know I eventually want to take 515T, so CSE 515T, uh, I can kind of draw this out as a graph. And I notice that it's got some prerequisites. So it requires a CSE. 417. So I'm going to draw that out here. And I'm going to draw a little arrow. So this is going to be a directed graph. I'm going to draw arrows from a prerequisite to a dependency. Uh, so so uh, 515 requires 417, so there's an arrow from 417 to 515. Um, so let's see, it, it, uh, so it requires 417. It also requires ESE 326. So um, I'm going to go ahead and put uh, ESE um, ESE 326 down here. Um, so there, there's also a dependency there. My graph seems a little bit messy. Uh, okay, let's start working backwards. So, so let's look at uh, Computer Science 417T. So that's, that's on this page somewhere. Uh, so we'll scroll up to 417. Oh, there it is. Um, oh yeah, so we already we already came across this one. Oh gosh, so this requires computer science 247. Good news, we're in 247. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and add that dependency in front of 417. Um, it also requires either ESE 326 or Math 3200. Oh well, I've already got ESE 326. That's a dependency for 515 anyway. But it's also a prereq for 417. Uh, oh gosh, this also requires two other math courses. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and sketch those in here. So uh, math 233 and math 309. This is getting a little messy. So that's a dependency, and that's a dependency. Gosh, I have to have four prereqs for that. Um, okay, 
Uh, well, let's continue to focus on the computer science thing. So 247, well, again, we're already in 247. Hopefully that uh, prereq's already met. Um, but I'm going to go back and look at it anyway, maybe if I was thinking about this process from the time I started. Oh, so it requires 131. Oh gosh, and let's continue to work backwards and see if 131 requires anything. Uh, oh, 131 doesn't have any prereqs. Great. Um, okay, so we've still got a couple of these courses that we haven't fully examined. So let's look at uh, ESE 326. So I've already got uh, WebStack open here to it. Oh, there it is. Uh, so it's probability and statistics for engineering. Oh, it's only prereq is uh, math 233. Okay, so I've already kind of got that in my gra graph here. So I'm going to draw an arrow from 233 to 326. Uh, and now let's also look at uh, math, two, uh, math uh, 326 and 309. Um, so let's see, 309. So I'm on the uh, math page now. Um, Yay, cookies. Um, so math 309 is matrix algebra. And um, let's see. Oh, good news. It doesn't have any prerequisites. Great. So we're kind of dead, done there. Uh, so let's look at 233. Uh, what is 233? I bet that's uh, it's got to be a calculus course, right? Um, Oh, there's 230. Oh, Calc 3. Uh, and it has a prerequisite of oh, 132, Math 132. Um, oh, gosh. So I bet that's Calc 2. But let, let's back up and look at Math 132. Um, and I, I can almost bet that it'll have a prereq of Calc 1. So uh, Math 132, prereq is 131. And back up to uh, 131 here. Uh, does it have a prereq? Oh, high school algebra. Okay, so so I'm going to assume that I've already got that out of the way. Um, okay, so when I'm all done here, I have this dependency graphs that shows nodes, and uh, the nodes happen to be courses, and the edges indicate dependencies. So an edge indicates a course that I have to have before a follow-on course. Okay, so a topological order is figuring out a, a schedule, basically, that we can take these classes such that the dependencies are met. And there are multiple valid topological orders. Um, so I'm going to assume that I'm only going to take one of these courses a semester. So it looks like I need one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine courses total. So, um, oh gosh, it looks like this is going to happen in, in grad school after eight semesters. Um, nonetheless, I'm going to go ahead and come up with some sort of a, a schedule here. So I could take a CSE 131 uh, and then maybe uh, next semester Math 131. And then um, at this point I could move on to either Math 132 or CSE 247. 247, sometimes offered during a summer. I bet uh, Math 132 might be too. Um, okay, so so at this point I would have taken this and then and then and this and then this and this. Uh, oh gosh, at this point I could take uh, either Math 233 or 309. I can't yet get to this because I I haven't uh, completed all of the prereqs, including ESE 326. So I think I'll take one of these next. Uh, math. 233, um, and then maybe ESE 326, uh, and then maybe Math 309, uh, and then maybe after Math 309, then I can take CSE 247, uh, 417, sorry, and then finally I can take uh, this 515T. Okay, this is a valid topological order. Okay, it's it's not you. It's not the only valid topological order. The only constraint that we have on topological orders is that uh, the dependencies must be met. We have to take all of the prereqs and their prereqs before we can finally take 515t. Okay, so uh, this idea of topological ordering uh, comes up a lot. Almost any time you're trying to construct some sort of a, a schedule of, of a complicated project with lots of dependencies, you may encounter uh, this concept of, of prerequisites, things that have to be done before. Uh, other things can be done.
Okay, so let's be a little bit more formal about what a topological sort is. So a topological order or a topological sort is something that can only be done on a directed graph because we're, we're trying to put things in order based on dependencies and the dependencies are indicated based on the direction of arrows. In fact, it also needs to be acyclic because of course cyclic dependencies would be kind of problematic. They could never be satisfied. Um, and so a topological sort is a linear, linear ordering of vertices. So in my previous example, I listed classes in order, assuming that I was taking only a single course per semester. Of course, we could actually, in a, an actual academic schedule, maybe take a couple of different courses that um, are all necessary prerequisites. At, at the same time, we could take, uh, for my particular example, both Math 131 and Computer Science 131 could be taken uh, first semester freshman year. They're not dependent on one another, but both of them are prerequisites for uh, other courses that I'll eventually need to take. Anyway, a topological sort is specifically about a linear ordering of vertices, and it has some specific requirements. So those vertices uh, such that for every edge in our graph, u to v, uh, u will come before v in the ordering. Okay, so a claim. So we'll explore this in studio, but the claim here is that if we run DFS on a directed acyclic graph G and enumerate its vertices in decreasing order of finishing time, so our version of DFS that keeps track of, uh, of uh, start and finish times, if we proceed through that and then sort all of those in decreasing order of finishing times, our result will be a topological order. Okay, so kind of a quick summary here. Uh, both BFS and DFS are really, really useful algorithms. Um, so BFS has some specific uses. It's really good at identifying the shortest distance from a start vertex and all of the vertexes it, it can reach. Um, so shortest in terms of the number of links. We'll also talk about other, notate, uh, other notions of distance and shortest paths later on. Um, it can also detect bipartite graphs, so that's graphs where the, the vertices can be divided into two distinct groups, um, and the, all of the edges go between those two groups, but not among nodes within either of those two groups. Um, it can also do bi bipartite matching, uh, that says machine, but it should say matching. Uh, and it can also search for solutions in artificial intelligence. So a lot of these search techniques and uses of graphs are really the foundation for a lot of uh, AI techniques. Um, much of traditional AI was, was founded on the concept of search. So uh, things like uh, playing games are a variation of the types of searches we're looking at. They're oftentimes an adversarial search where um, you're kind of simulating, making alternating turns. Uh, but a lot of AI is also about optimization or problem solving, which is very, very comparable to uses of BFS and DFS. Okay, so DFS also has a variety of different uses. So it can detect cycles, so it can detect whether we have an acyclic graph or not. Um, it can do dependency resolution, as we've seen with the topological sort. We can identify an ordering here that uh, ensures dependencies are met, prereqs are met. Um, it can also uh, be used to determine reachability, um, so there's a concept of strongly connected components uh, which can be used to detect. 